I think the Ides of March got a little hungover this year. We're, <laughs> we're in March 21st, 2011 on a snowy day, if you can believe it, when it's supposed to be spring. Well, we braved the elements, Dr. John Southwick, my dear friend, and me and Calvin with his camera, and we're at the Champlain Memorial Library on Elm Street with a story to tell. And I didn't know much about that story until John prepped me once I got here today. It's a great story. How are you, John? I'm fine, Gordy. Driving, nice up, to, driving up the North Way, I was thinking about the first time we ever met. I have, you, you know, any time I need to make an impression on somebody, I drop your name. Oh, gee. <laughs> that sounds and, like... And the most fun I've ever had doing this program, and Calvin and I have had a lot of fun doing this program, was when we got together with the rodeo doctors. And I was telling somebody yesterday, coming out of the wonderful musical at Chazy Central Rural School put on by the music theater, uh, about rodeo, and of course they had no idea. I said, retired, old doctors eat out. And that always elicits a, a chuckle. And then I told them about the time we had telling stories out of school that and was, that was good wasn't it it was excellent and two of the ones that we and I guess we got them later or somehow got them later with A.B. de Grand Prix and George Clark those oh. are the people and Bill Ledoux my goodness just wonderful are, people yeah. A.B. de Grand Prix and, and Dr. John Southwick in the days when doctoring was doctoring and I'll tell you that you didn't ha ever do it on a horse but you had some pretty old flivvers in the old days I did it on a snowmobile. <laughs> did you I, really? I should have known. What was that? What was the huge the storm. That we had in that storm, in 72, was it 72 or 73? Well, we had somewhere. him then. Yeah. And it was, it was impassable. It was awful. I had to get to Ross's Point, so I went in the snowmobile there, and then an individual north of me had all sorts of lung problems, so I got on the snowmobile, and there were banks like this. And when I came back down from visiting, went over one bank, came back down, broke the steering on on that snow sled. It was a big old snow sled, too. Kept them going. But anyway, those are, those, those are incidental things. Oh, we, but we've had a lot of good times together, yeah. you and I and Calvin. So we're here for a very specific reason that this, this library, you gave me a little history of the library that dates back. When was the, the building built here on Elm Street? Was it 19? You know, I, have to, I have to look it up every once in a while. Uh, it's around the corner. There's a plaque around the corner. It's about is it 40 years? Is it that long? I think it's at least 40 years, yeah. But some of it has to do with you getting a scholarship to go to well, college. Well, yeah, it did. It had to do with the Atwoods. The Atwoods, uh, Arthur and Florence Atwood, had a scholarship in honor of their second son, who was lost in a submarine uh, accident in World War II. And it was to Yale. I didn't get in the first year, but they took me over to be their home in 1950. And 50 to 51, stayed with them and then went to Yale for four years after that. So they were instrumental in getting me in. And, and later on, when we had uh, need for a, a library, Mrs. Atwood, Florence Atwood said, uh, what can we do? And I said, well, we need a library. So she funded most of this library building. And 1970, Calvin. 1970, yeah. So I, I can read years. his lips after all these years. So 40 years, right? Isn't that... Huh? 41. 41, 41 that's, that's right. 19. Oh, my goodness. Well, that's one. it's a beautiful place. It happens to be closed today, so we can see the open sign facing us inside yes. the library. Uh, why was it put here? Yeah, huh? Why was it put why here? Why was it put on this spot? I think the land was available, or I don't know. Calvin, you got a question that I can't answer. Well, so a that, lot of questions. Because it's convenient for the kids at, at, at the school. elementary and school. At the sure. school, right? Just a hoop and a holler across the... And then what happened to the school? <laughs> and there you go. <laughs> you want to get into that? And that's another story entirely, isn't it? Yeah, oh, that's a story. Oh, boy. Well, we won't get into that. You told me, and we'll, we'll soon get into the reason we had that tombstone up when we started the program, but you told me you were the only one in your high school class that was going to go to college? Now, wait a minute. Now, I'm going to get in trouble. I hope so. There were several others that went to college, but not that year. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. 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 
I'm glad now, we I'll tell you when this happened, when it came out that I gave a little bit of this talk about my experience at Clinton Community College, it came out that I was the only one going to college that year. Uh, so I fell into the scholarship without any competition. <laughs> well, I heard from Joyce Robinson, Zona Pettis, these are their maiden names, and Donald Guigware, and I must have been some others too that said, hey, who do you think you are? <laughs> You're the don't only you one. Yeah, uh, well, the they great old right. North Country, they, they don't they let, the, let, they don't let the, no, the they dogs don't let lie, them. do they? No, no. <laughs> anyway, everyone in my graduating class is still alive. How about yours? No, we lost five. Did you lose five? That's mm -hmm. pretty good, though, yeah. considering I only had nine, I think, nine members in my class. We had 19. And so, oh, you had a big class. Yeah, we did. Biggest class ever at Champlain Central. Isn't that wonderful? Champlain High School. <coughs> it was Champlain High School at the time. It wasn't yeah. Central yet. Anyhow, why did we show that picture of James Lucas? You want me to answer that? Yes, I okay, do. Okay, James Lucas was an uncle of a first cousin once removed of mine. Now let's back up, okay? <laughs> wow. James Lucas' nephew, Broder Lucas, was first cousin of my father's. His mother and my grandfather. I'm going to show Broder right here. He's, yeah, he's, he's the one where the, my, my a, finger is, right over here on your right hand side. He was. Broder's mother and my grandfather, Orrin Southwick, were brother and sister. Now, mind you, this photograph wasn't taken last Tuesday. It's 1985. I'm right. sorry, Calvin. Mm -hmm. Yes. Broder died in 1992, one week prior to his 90th birthday. You told me he was a hippie before the word was well, invented. Now, that's my mother's definition. Okay. Well, you see, he it qualifies everything. Yes, you have to do that. But Broder looked like, and I'm not talking out of school because he's a relative and you're allowed to say things oh, about sure. your relatives oh, yeah. that I wouldn't say about my patients <laughs> maybe. Broder used to walk uh, with saddle shoes and he'd walk from Perry's Mills to Champlain even when there was transportation available. And if he, if you saw him on the street you would think that he was a street person. But he had a mind that was so amazing he remembered things, and he was uh, uh, friends with consultants of presidents. One of them, John Kenneth Galbraith, who was an oh. economist from oh, had sure. his home in New Hampshire. Broder and he used to exchange visits. Broder could go from Champ. I'm jumping. Okay, could go from Champlain to California, and not cost him a night's lodging. He knew people all along the way, Isn't that great? and even find people maybe that would have a gas station for uh, car, uh, but he would re reciprocate. Yeah. And if you went to visit him, everything was on him, so it was kind of an even thing. But such a great storyteller, a lot of information, and never repeat himself. When you listen, you'd think for a while when you first heard him that maybe this is something you heard before. No, it would be something different. A new story. No. And he went. My mother called him original hippie. He started at Cornell, taught there, went to Little Rock, Arkansas, went to Salt Lake City, went to California, ended up in Hawaii for his final uh, teaching in Hawaii. That's not a bad circuit, is it? No, it isn't. No, no. <laughs> isn't that wonderful? But anyway, his uncle, James Lucas, was in Civil War, and he wrote 60 letters back to his mother, brother, and sister. Never wrote any to his father. And my understanding is, or maybe my misunderstanding is, maybe he didn't write to his father because his father was upset because he left the farm and went in the service, volunteered for the service. He was in the uh, 153rd Regiment, uh, New York Volunteers, and he wrote these 60 letters back and about six or seven years ago, I got a call from Broder's son, Jim, who lives in Hawaii, saying yeah. Broder had a safety deposit box in Key Bank in Plattsburgh, number of letters there with other information and a ring, a gold ring and another ring, and he wondered if I would open it up, see what was there. He didn't really care much about the letters, maybe. He told me to send him copies of the letters if I wanted to, 
So I called them after we got the letters, and these were the 60 letters that Uncle Jim, original letters, Uncle Jim wrote to his mother, sister, and brothers. So Jim never really won them, so we have the letters. Isn't that wonderful? And what a want, legacy. Want, yeah. I've been told we are not going to take the original letters out of the oh, acid oh. tree. Holder. Okay, I'm going to hold the microphone all up right, here okay. so we don't have a sound. But you want to see these? You want these? Well, you've got them all transcribed anyway. Got so we all transcribed. Just to get so we don't have to get the, the acid from our fingers on there. No, no we don't. We okay. know why we don't have the original photograph here today, too, that tint type. Yeah. <laughs> we left that at home. Did you show I that? I showed it. Okay. I've got a couple of those. Okay. So Not of if him, you want, others. do you want me to go through these letters? I have 20 of them that I picked out that have interesting, I think, interesting sentences in about where he was, what he was doing, uh, and I'll start with the first now, one. Now, what we started in from Alexandria, October 23rd, 1862, and yes. they went till the end of the war? Yeah, well, no, to 1864. Two years. Yeah, when he got killed. Oh, he did get killed. I forgot that part that, of it. I was going to leave that suspense till the end, but... Uh, oh, too bad. Yeah, he dies. You see, his date of birth, is, or his death date is not on here, right? No. Nope. Okay. But it's here. So where's the cemetery? Baltimore, Maryland. It is? Yes. Mm -hmm. In Baltimore. Before I get started, I've already started, but before I go any further, I have to pay tribute to Kimberly LeMay. Kimberly LeMay took all these letters and read them through and was able to decipher that writing, which is just as bad as mine is, and able to print out in letter form so that we can read what was there. Because if you tried to read those letters, it would take you a long time to decipher what's in there. Some people have a special eye right. for reading uh, cursive letters with people who couldn't write very well. Compared to my writing as a child, that's right. <laughs> that's Palmer method right there. That's <laughs> I can write much, much better now than I could when I was a youngster. So I here, can't. this is really? <laughs> well, doctors aren't supposed to. Well, I've learned that I should write better, so I take my time now. Go ahead. How many prescriptions did you write over Oh, my goodness. There? That's impossible to tell. But really. you know what? We're on the... We're on the cusp of a new age. Actually, we're into a new age uh, with, with health care, et cetera, et cetera, as you well know. But prescriptions, for the most part, from this day forward, except for a few old holdouts who want to do it by hand, are done electronically. Yes. So no longer does a druggist have to say, what the heck did John order here? Right. And it's efficient, more efficient in so many ways. All this information is exchanged electronically. Isn't that amazing? Example, I stopped in at my eye doctor and I need eye drops. And they said, no, we don't write out the prescriptions anymore. They do just exactly yeah, electronically. what you do. Cool, huh? Okay. Back to the civil, we peel away the years as if they were nothing here. Yeah. But this is wonderful to have the life of a young man in the service from the North Country. Right. Where did he originally live? Where was he born? He, um, he was born in Perry's Mills area. Now he spent his father, Broder Lucas's grandfather, uh, had farms on both sides of the border. Perry's Mill, Perry Mills, not Perry. Well, what? Perry no, Mills. Listen, we, we got that we right. We watch him on television as they're talking Perry's. about Perry. I like Perry's. I like the S yeah, on it. Perry's. Yeah, we no, it's Perry. I'll tell you why it's changed. Like, All right. All right. Okay, yeah. we'll do that. Okay, both sides of the border. <laughs> so in the uh, Perry Mill, Perry's Mills era, area. Okay, and um, so uh, we'll start with the letters. I've taken twenty of the letters that I thought had some interesting information, and we'll read excerpts from them, not right. the whole letter. That's okay. Fine. So this is a letter written to his mother from Alexandria, October 23rd, 1862. Dear Mother, I write these few lines to let you know I'm so well and how I like this place. We started from Fonda, New York. On Saturday night, got to New York Sunday morning, stayed there, T-H-A-R-E. But that's all right. That's the way you wrote it. Sure. From uh, 
start and there until Monday noon, then started for Washington. Now we're on Alexandria, 10 miles from Washington. We had good times. We stopped at Ar Albany and had a good dinner. And when we came to Philadelphia, we had as nice a meal as I ever ate. And as I said the other night, I wonder how his mother felt about yeah, that. Yeah, that's cute. Interesting about his mother. His mother was the second wife, which very often happened back then. Wife dies in childbirth, husband goes out, got all these kids, gets another wife somehow or other. Of course. So he was probably, I think, from what I can tell, a his father, uh, his brother Fred, who was Broder's father, were half brothers. Okay, that really doesn't. Was matter. he was he a teenager when he when he went in the service? Yeah, he was eighteen. Yeah. Okay, just okay. to get the perspective, yeah. right? We are in tents and on the banks of the Potomac. There are some 40,000 soldiers here in forts and tents. Wow. It's the nicest building that ever I ex Oh, no. I'll be getting on here. I'm sorry. I got ahead of time. Uh, okay. There's some 40,000 soldiers here in forts and tents. I've seen the capital of Washington. It is the nicest building that ever I expected to see. All our companies seen it. We was nearly two hours looking through it, and then we did not see over half of it. It's all marble and has been a building this 40 years and is not done yet. So you may think it is worth looking at. Rick is our captain, and I'm glad of it. Charles Knapp, K-N-A-P-P, -P, from Moores is second lieutenant, and McGuire from Plattsburgh is first. I like them all well. I've seen a great deal of the world since I left home. We expect to stay here sometime yet. We have the nicest regiment that people say that ever went through the places we stopped. Now I want you to write as soon as you can. And direct it to the 153rd Regiment Company, 1st New York Volunteer, Alexandria and Virginia. Next letter, again to his mother. Alexandria, November 6, 1862. There are some of the Champlain boys here. Leander Myett, M-E-Y-E-T-T, -T, was here a day or two ago, and he looks well. He says that Charlie Dodds is an orderly for some officer, and that Freeman is orderly. Freeman turns out to be a Bowron, B-O-W-R-O-N. And the boys in the 108th is only eight miles from here. Some of them here is to us is a Duffy and Fabria, F. R-A-B-Y-A. -A. That's a question mark, maybe not spelled right. And there's another Bowron called Benjamin that he talks about. So there are Freeman and Benjamin Bowron. He talks about money frequently throughout. We'll have some money in a day or two, I suppose. And the way it will be is that we will take checks for as much as you want to send home. They will send home one check if it does not get home safely, it's only written out to the person that, uh, that can draw on it. So if it doesn't get there safely, let me know and I'll give you another check. Next one is from Alexandria again, November 15th, 1862. And this is written to Broder Lucas's brother Fred. First thing, we have pretty good living. We have fresh meat twice a week and we have rice, beans, salt pork, beef and sugar. Broder's father? Yes, Fred, Fred is Broder's father. Right. James's brother. James's brother, half brother. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. okay. You said we, Broder's brother. Yeah. I did. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for being there, Cal. <laughs> <and laughs> Keep us in line. Here's your, your little conscience back there yeah. behind the camera. Yeah. Keeps us straight here. I have an editor at home, but when I'm with Calvin, <laughs> he's my editor. <laughs> yeah. So I said we have uh, uh, fresh meat twice a week, have beans salt for beef and sugar, and we have plenty of candles so we can read and write until we are tired. Douglas is 8th Corporal, D-O-U-G-L-A-S-S. -S. That's the North Country name. He didn't say where he's from. And Stacia, S-T-A-T-I-A, -A, is a little homesick. And again, he talks about Freeman Bowerin. Uh, Tell Pa that I'm well yet. He very doesn't very often uh, say much about his father, ask about or tell his father much. I hear that they are drafting in Champlain. If it is so, I'm afraid that Charles will have to leave poor Libby. That's another 
brother of his. Another brother of James is Charles, and obviously Libby is his wife. Okay, the next letter is November 27th, 1862, again written to Fred Broder's father. I'm not homesick yet. It says Douglas to me, uh, I'm sorry, let me go back. I and Douglas went to meeting last Sunday with a squad of men. There was a good organ. I, I got to be careful of this, but I'm going to say it anyway. There was a good organ in the church, and you'll know what religion he's going to. Good organ, but the rest was not so great. It was the Catholic Church. <laughs> Don't you love it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, good organ, huh? yeah. Oh, that's great. There are 104 of the 118 boys here at the same time, all from Champlain. They all look well. Uh, Brother Ben, that's Ben uh, in relation to uh, Freeman. And there's a Trudel, T-R-U-D-E-L. And an Alex Lablo, L-A-B-L-U, Lablu, Lablu. And Chubb LaFountain. Wow. Uh, and then he goes on to say that uh, he got a letter from a Harley Hubble, or Harley Hubble, that's another local person. Uh, got a letter from home saying that there were a lot of deserters in Canada. Oh, -ho. Uh, even back then. Eh? Right. And I tell you, Fred, it's not been very pleasant this week. A lot of mud. It rains harder here than to home. To home, huh? Yeah, the next one is December 23rd, 1862. Dear Mother, I tell you, we have had a good Christmas dinner and New Year's too. Uh, and when I wrote to Freddie, that's Broder's father again, I expected to, and he gets upset with Fred because apparently Fred doesn't write very often. <laughs> when I wrote to Freddie, I expected to an answer from him. So I waited for it and didn't come. When Ben Brown came, I thought maybe you did not expect to write to me that week. So I thought it was all, I was all right. Freeman and Benjamin Bowen was here again. Last Sunday we had a good time. One that I did not expect to see was Albert Cook, another Champlainer. I stayed overnight with Eugene Gilbert. U-G-E-A-N. Must be Eugene, or Eugene, or Eugene. Uh, Gilbert, and Ben Rogers. And from Champlain, there was a Hubble and a Pelka. P-E-L-K-A, and a couple for Corbo. I figured it might be Corbo Creek or Coopersville. And mm -hmm. Golke from Champlain. Oh, sure. Uh, there are good many sick in our regiment, but for me, I'm in good health. I've gained about three pounds since I left. I've had a good supper once in a while, and he met this Douglas again. He says he's tough as ever, but he makes a good soldier. You spoke about my using tobacco. I am not such a fool, he said. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I wrote my mother things like that, too. <laughs> a little we bit she know. That. <laughs> yeah. The next letter, January 15th, 1863, again to his mother. You spoke of me telling Pa about attending the Congress. Well, I was just going to it when I received your letter. I like attending it very well. And as you said, there are a good many smart speakers there. I wonder if it would be said today. <laughs> you wanted to know if our pay was enlarged. It is not yet, but I hopes it will be. I expect it to be paid some of these days, and I think I'll be able to send you something. But as much as I would like to, I'm not sure. Uh, he talks about Charlie Hubble's brother had re-enlisted. He says, I think he's foolish. Sam Underhill has done the same and gone home on a furlough. He talks again about this Stacia. I will tell you, you just gave him the right name when you called him a puke. He's nothing more. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Boys don't care much for him anyway. Oh, God. Next one is, uh, again, Camp Alexander. And I don't know where that is. I didn't look it up. Camp Alexander. I don't think it's Alexandria, Virginia. January 5th, 1863. Dear Mother, you wanted to know if there were many sick in our regiment and if we had hospitals for them, 
There are a good many sick in the hospital, and we have a large building in the city and some hospital tents on the ground. But there's so many sick, as a spell ago, there were so many homesick and laid around until they really got sick. Uh, and he talks about a Colonel Ellsworth. I'm not sure who that is. I'm as well as uh, at home, and Alexander Douglas thinks I look better. We've been mustered in uh, some pay. Some thinks we will be paid the tenth of the month, and I hope so. He keeps talking about being paid or not being paid. This is another one. Dear Mother, January 18, 1863. Captain Rick, that was his captain, came up to the camp from the generals and gave orders to our colonels to give us all 40 rounds of cartridges, and so he did. It was heard that Stewart's, Stewart's rebel cavalry was up in Fairfax Seminary at about 12 miles from here. So we had our cartridges. We would be prepared for orders. So we, after roll call, all went to bed, and one morning, on one in the morning, we were wakened by the beating of the drums. So we all got rigged up and was on our company ground. Then it was not long until the colonel came and told us to be prepared for a march, take our blankets with us, and be ready at two. So we got ready, and we, at two, we marched about two miles from here. Then we draw up in a line of battle. There were five or six regiments and a lot of cavalry and ahead of us. And they did see them at Fairfax, but only a little skirmish. Well, we stacked our guns and went back. So not much of a battle there. This is Alexandria, January 22nd, 1863. Dear sister, Caroline's the sister. Our company is detached from the regiment. Our duty is to escort some soldiers that have been in hospitals, and when they get better, send them back all to their camps, uh, or they came from convalescent camps. I would like to have went yesterday to see Douglas because Douglas had seen Rob Lewis, Lucas, Robert Lucas. He's another one from James, not related, not related to James. Next one is January 23rd, 1863, Camp Alexandria, dear brother. We've been detached from the regiment for the purpose of taking soldiers. Tells the same thing that he just did before to his mother. This is another one, June 23rd. Now we're going from January to June 23rd, 1863. Still in Alexandria. This is to Fred, Broder's, again Broder's father. They were all fighting all around in every direction. And I was out in front yesterday with a first lieutenant and six men to take 200 men down to their corps. And I will tell you where we went to. It was in Union Mills, seven miles above Fairfax Courthouse. We went as far as we could by train as it does not run any farther than Union Mills. And we found Hooker's headquarters. He likes Joe Hooker, the general, and Kilpatrick also. Fred, I saw George Dodds there and Sam Underhill. These are names locally. These are pretty, but pretty famous general, Hooker and yeah. Stewart and all those oh, people. Oh, yes, that, yes. Yeah, you know, the, yeah. the, those people who are students of the Civil War history will remember from Gettysburg. Yeah, you, so. t you talk, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. You talked about the rodeo club, and I didn't go this last Monday, but they had somebody there who was talking about Civil War, because, as you know, and everybody knows, we're starting the 150th oh, sure. anniversary of the Civil War. Here's Alexandria, January 29th, 1863. Uh, so I went back. Well, well I went June, back. So we're, yeah, we're, so back, we're back again. Uh, because there's some other letters that I picked out that I thought had some interesting things. Okay. Our company was the best in the regiment every time we came to unexpected inspection. We have the praise of being the best. We have some pay tomorrow as they are paying the regiment. We expect some pay tomorrow as they are paying the regiments next to us. Alexander Douglas and Robert Lucas uh, and our, uh, w was with our sergeant that we knew that he was from Plattsburgh. Benny Rogers has been down to see us. Lieutenant McGuire that we said was from Plattsburgh or Keysville. I think I have it somewhere else. And Lieutenant Knapp. The war goes pretty slow. It is not doing very much nowadays. Back to March of 9, 1863. Dear brother, Alexander Douglas and I were on duty today. Uh, I'll tell you 
we have a good orderly sergeant. He's the one that traveled a good deal. He knows more than ever Lieutenant Knapp. He doesn't think very much of this Lieutenant Knapp from Moores. He said Lieutenant Knapp will ever know. Uh, First Lieutenant McGuire is a pretty good fellow, and he's from Plattsburgh. We've got that. Uh, I've had very good times, as I as good as be, to be expected. I will tell you what we get to eat. He's talking again about eating. We have fresh beef twice a week, pork the rest of the time, except when they bring in bacon. We have coffee and tea, some potatoes sometimes, molasses to eat, and rice. We live very well. If we don't live, it ain't because we don't get enough to eat. <laughs> That's a great line. Here's, is this nap, is he related to? I don't know. You don't know he's probably. Tell about the naps in the Southwest. Yeah, yeah. Well, could be. Could be. Could be. Yeah, you want to know, know about the naps in the Southwest? Yeah, of course okay. we do. Uh, More snap and Orrin Southwick, my grandfather, started a, two of five people that started Champlain Telephone Company in 1903. Shortly after it was established, uh, More snap, my grandfather bought out the other. To one, I think, I'm quite sure, was uh, Bill Kennedy, and uh, I'm not sure about the others. It's written down somewhere, but isn't here. Sorry. Anyway, they bought it out, and we were partners for quite a long time until uh, Morris died, and then his son um, uh, and my father, Charles, became partners. And then later on, it's gone down the line to uh, my brother Dave and uh, uh, who else was in between? Oh, Edith Knapp. Edith Knapp became uh, the major partner uh, after her husband died. And then um, uh, presently, it's uh, Trent Trahan, uh, and uh, principally that's it now. Edith's nephew. Edith's nephew, yeah. See, it's always good to have Calvin back there. To oh, sure. Fill us in. I would have brought Joanne, uh, but she knows. But then you could have brought the picture if you would have brought Joanne. Yes, she could have right. had carried it. I, have, I offered her a ride over here. Oh, did you? Okay, now we're back to Alexandria, <laughs> April 1st, 1863. Dear Sister Caroline, Caroline said you hoped that if I had any part in a battle I would not receive any injuries. I do not know yet, as I will be in a battle very soon or not. Some thinks we may stay here three months more, but fighting Joe Hooker says he will give the men ten days march, and during that time he will give them, mean the Rebs, two fights if one won't finish them. I suppose he will try it soon. All the men like him well. Cyrus Kellogg, that's another name, has gone to his regiment yesterday. He says Emerson Smith is in a convalescent camp. Uh, both of those are local. This one's May 6, 1863. Again, Alexandria, written to Brother Charles. I will tell you that I get along soldiering very well so far. And all the Champlain boys are well. Charlie Dodds was here the other day and with John LaFountain. Now, this is the second LaFountain. I don't think they're the same. I mentioned a Chubb LaFountain. Yeah. Now he calls this LaFountain, spelled the same way. Um, and the reason I say that, there are LaFontaines, L-A-F-O-N-T-A-I-N-E, and this is L-A-F-O-U-N-T-A-I-N. Uh, and we had a good time with Charles, and he talks about uh, old Joe Hooker is fighting along a way like a good fellow at Fredericksburg. He sent a lot of prisoners here to Washington. And they looked hard with their old gray clothes. And here he holds Fredericksburg and a lot of their rifle pits. So I think he must be doing very well. For I've seen an awful lot, again, says a lot of prisoners from here. Next is June 10th, 1863, again from Alexandria. This is to his mother. There's a Captain Strain, a relative of Brinkerhoff's in Champlain. I knew the Brinkerhoffs in Plattsburgh, but I never knew of Champlain Brinkerhoffs. So it must have been. Maybe I'm not up on my local history as well as I should be. So. I, I just don't know. Yeah. 
uh, our beautiful Lieutenant Colonel Armstrong, the one that was going to fight for his country, what did he do but fill his pockets with money and then he was decommissioned. <laughs> oh, then he was decommissioned. Uh, it happens in every war. I it? guess so. I guess so. Next one is Alexandria again, June 15th, 1863. He's going back and tell us his mother this time about, because his mother wants to know more about who his officers are. First lieutenant is John McGuire. He's from Keysville. Second lieutenant, Charles Knapp from Moores. We've got the same orderly yet. His name is Thomas Breen. And he knows more than the second lieutenant. That's the second reference he gives to not being very confident and lieutenant uh, Charles Knapp. You wanted to know if the rebels had made that raid on our city? No, they have not. You wanted to know if I had hard work? Well, I will let you know that we have good times and we expect to have more. Next letter is July 1st, 1863, again Alexandria, Virginia. Well, I do not know, but I think it is right to change them so often. He's talking about being upset because Joe Hooker has been, uh, they've changed commanders, and Hooker's no longer the general. And he doesn't like that idea of changing commanders. Most rebel movements is made out of the way to Harper's Ferry. We have only four miles from them now, but I don't know how heavy a force they may have, but is though as to be not very strong, thought to be not very strong, but we'll find out about that. Next letter is August 8, 1863. Uh, send, oh, uh, oh, this is a letter to his mother when he hears about the Redcoats convening north of the border and prior to the invasion of St. Albans, because the British thought that they could somehow help the Confederates and bring that war to a resolve that would be in their favor. I think they thought that if they helped the Confederates win, that the British would have more power to come back to our country and take it over again. That's what he says. You wanted to know how my health was. It's very good. I'm a little thin. I've had good times so far. You said that Charles paid $300 at called conscription. He paid three hundred dollars to someone to take his place oh, in the sure. draft. And I told common. Yeah, well I have two Southwicks that are buried up in Moore's Forks that did that. And the story is they hid up in a log cabin up there. Well I don't know why they had to hide if well, they you got paid, to just pay it. Pay it, and that's right. But he says if there's another draft, he may be in the same fix. So that only gets him out of this present draft. Next well, is, mind you, 300 bucks was a lot of money oh my in 1863. Goodness, yes. Yeah, yes. Big money. Oh. Uh, this one's Washington, D.C., September 1st, 1863. Dear Mother, and uh, there was another one here, 1863. Now, really, what he's talking about here as things that have gone on back home about the weevil getting into the wheat field back home. Uh, Robert, he talks about Rob Lucas. Robert Lucas is doing well in Alexandria. He's quite a money-making fellow, whatever that means, I don't know. Okay, the next letter is to Fred, brother. Uh, no date on this. Our regiment, dear, well, Fred, our regiment has got marching orders and probably we'll have to move, but I don't know yet where it will be. I don't think we will go with the regiment, but if so, we are ready to go. Well, Freeman Bowron has been over here to see us and he looks well and tough as can be. If our company does not go with the regiment, Alexander Douglas and I are going over to Washington to see Freeman and Charlie. It's only an hour's ride to the, from the city of Alexandria. Next letter is March 4th. I wonder how far that is, an hour's ride. Well, if you, you know, he must be on horseback, I would think. That there were trains, but he talks about the short distances that trains went. Yeah, 10 so, or 12 miles, maybe. Uh, well, yeah, if you can go 10 or 12 miles an hour with a horse, I suppose, yeah. 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 Uh, this one is written from New Orleans. Now, he's traveled down to Mississippi, and now he's in New Orleans. Uh, he and his regiment were sent there. We just left the boat this morning, 
quite a bustle in the old building. I will not be able to tell you where we will be, what we will be doing this time. We are situated on the opposite side of the river from New Orleans at a place called Algiers in an old rough building. But everything is cheap and it's a very nice place, though I'd like the other side of the river. You know, he mentions money a lot, and then he mentions in one place we has to buy some of his clothes. Huh. And I was not aware of this. I suppose real historians of Civil War knew that this probably took place. We have nice views of plantations. I will tell you there are some rich men around this part of the country. You may tell Pa that I think I have been something like a mile from a cow's tail at this time. Meaning, he, to my mind, he doesn't really care that he's that far away from the farm. It can be gone as far as he's concerned. And he talks about Douglas. That's a, that's and a good line. I'm going to remember that. Yeah. A mile from the cow's tail. A mile, right? mile from I'd the cow's love tail. It. Yeah. Uh, and then he talks about Douglas and Hubble again. The next letter is on April 18th, 1864. Uh, I received a welcome letter last evening and thought I would answer it immediately. We are now at what we might call rough soldiering. Though my health is good, I'm not quite as fleshy as was a few months ago. Uh, Charlie Hubble is at the Provost Marshal in New Orleans. Charles, this is talking about Charles's brother. We have been uh, on a roving expedition since 15th of March, and this is on the 18th of April he wrote the letter. Some days we could march 16 to 20 miles a day, and it happened that way on the 8th of April and the 13th. Uh, and the Army Corps, the, I'm sorry, the 13th Army Corps came on the rebels and he had an awful long wagon train, and they got hold of them, and our corps ordered up to support the 13th, or it would have been bad luck. But I think that they might have ordered up our corps before we had stuck our tents. They could have saved us some time. Some of the regiments of the 13th are small now. Our corps, our corps fought, fought well, and that night we had been in our corps train. Uh, Guard, there's a question mark. Our corps fought well, and that night we had been on our corps train and questioned the guard to guard the regiment, or we'd been a fight. But we retreated in the night so we could get another corps to support. And the Rebs said next day they were going to cut us to pieces. Well, we got as far as we were going that night, about eight miles from where we came from, when the word came that the Rebs were coming. Then the cavalry came up and formed several lines in direction that we would expect them. And our division lay in a ravine in the woods. And by the time the firing was going fast, the balls began to whistle uh, on the Rebs. We took a few prisoners and all the musketry that one ever had and that they ever had. There were some shells on both sides. Our line was relieved at dusk. When the firing ceased, we got the best that day. Okay, the next letter is then Steamship Crescent on his way back from New Orleans. Uh, dear Mother, I with regiment, I with the regiment left Morganzia, Louisiana on the 1st of July, got on board the Crescent and started for New Orleans as we suppose. But when we arrived in New Orleans, our orders was to land for the ship to get a supply of coal and provisions and to keep going. It was Sunday, uh, that being that evening, started off and the orders were sealed not to be opened until crossing the Mississippi River. When, they, uh, when we got across, and the orders was to report to Fort Monroe, Virginia. We have now nine days coming, uh, getting back to uh, Fort Montgomery, I mean, sorry, uh, uh, Fort Monroe. The two Hubble boys are with us and well. Charlie had a hard time to stand the climate. Douglas is well and sends his respect to all. Do not care about going to soldier in the state of Louisiana anymore. Uh -huh. Too hot. This one is August 25th, 1864. Holton, Virginia. Dear brother, I am, will now tell you what we have been doing for the past few days. Last Sunday we were about four miles from above Charleston. And I was down to the brook washing about 10 o'clock in the day when I heard some skirmishing. 
It was not long until the cannons opened, so I hurried to camp, and it was not long until we were in line and on the move. The Sixth Corps lay in, on our right, and our division moved to the right of Charleston. Then, in the rear of the Sixth, they fighting like good fellows. The rebels thought to surprise us and came full force on the picket, and the Sixth fell into line double quick and drove them back and held the ground, we being in the rear. Had breastworks. I told, uh, I really had forgotten what breastworks. You know what they are. Oh, sure. Yeah, they're like, they're, they're like uh, uh, a channel with, uh, that are dug only to protect the breast, yep. not a deep trench. Uh, I thought today that it was curious that Charles Brown Carter, I'm sorry, Charles Carter did not come to see me. And he said, well, I found out later that he had been uh, injured and was in the hospital. We have two lines of battle here opposite the fair. Okay, now the next one is again from, this time it's from Harrisonburg, Harrisonburg, Virginia. September 26, 1864, dear mother, I now take the pleasure, because he's been in fighting, he now takes the pleasure of writing you a few lines to let me know that I'm still alive, and I suppose you are very anxious to hear how I am since our regiment of the 19th Infantry, it was a severe battle. Snow off the roof or something? Well, we heard a little sound there in the background. We stopped the camera for a moment. Somebody had put some books in the drop. We thought Since it was the library is closed today. We, we thought, thought it was a reenactment of the Civil War. We and thought, somebody the, was bombing we thought the ghost of James Lucas had come back for a minute, but alas, it wasn't. All right, go ahead, John. Okay, we drove them like sheep from the field. It was the first time I ever saw the rebel flags running. I love it. The poor Johnnies lay there thick in the field with some with their heads and legs cut off. Oh, my, my. my. But he has to put that in, huh? Well, we know. charged an open field three times and five with five pieces of artillery. We had not as good a position as they, but we took a lot of prisoners and drove them about two miles from the field and finally lay down to sleep after dark. The next day we followed them. They said they were going to make a stand at Strasburg, and we got there on the 21st and drove them from there. After some skirmishing, they fell back to Fisher's Hill, where they had breastworks, we built strong works that night, and the next morning went to skirmishing with them as they had breastworks in our front. About four o'clock, the order was given to charge them as it was a skirmish line, and they did with a yell. If you was to see them run to their second line of works, that was something. Then the Eighth Corps, the eighth corps was ordered up to the right flank of their works while the Johnnies were watching them. Our corps and six charged to the left, and center just as the sun was going down. About three quarters of a mile, the Johnnies run like sheep from their breastwork at Fisher's Hill. We took 23 cannons and a good number of prisoners. We followed them all that night. They had but one piece of artillery left. About one in the night, we got pretty close, and they, the rear guard, fired at our advance. We wheeled into line and went, so they opened a piece of artillery. I saw plain the flash and shells coming on the road. We sent and had two divisions of cavalry come to the front and after them. They soon opened on them. We kept on until daylight marching when we came to a town called Woodstock, where we halted and stayed until 12 o'clock. And if you see the graybacks that hid in the night in the gardens and barns and woods, they were coming from all quarters and squads under guards. We came on about 12 miles and encamped. The cavalry was on ahead and had engaged them and fell back. So the next day, we came on to them about 3 o'clock. They receiving, having received some 5,000 reinforcements, took the rear, but we soon made them pick up. About 5 o'clock, our regiment relieved the skirmish line in front of the brigade and was going on pretty brisk. We blazed at them, and they at us until dark, and we were the picket. We were the picket that night. I guess that means they killed their ground and yep. went after them. And I tell you, it was a cool one. The next morning, we was the skirmish line and we saw two dead greys. We marched all day at a good jog and came to this town and encamped. There's over 1,000 wounded in hospitals in this town. We are going to Lynchburg. We are about 60 miles from the first battleground. We have a good general. 
I just want to stop for a moment yeah. to reflect on that letter. That was an unpublished, in-person report, almost like a live reporter from the yeah. battlefield would be today. And that description is probably not written down in any library. Yeah. So <clears throat> you could go back and compare those, that letter, with a, a, somebody else who, who did get their report published of that battle and compare notes. Yeah. Um, thanks to uh, Civil War era photographer Matthew Brady, who took thousands upon thousands of photographs, because photography was well established by then, and his photographs have, have chronicled so many things. And you, you talk, you know, you were describing the horrors of what he saw in the battlefield with yeah. people with missing heads and legs, and we've seen those pictures. Yeah. And he talked about field hospitals, which, I mean, they were they were bad enough. They were bad enough in Korea, right? Never oh. mind. And you talked about A.B. de Grand Prix during World War II. With World War II, mm -hmm. imagine what it was like mm. with dead horses and people laying in the field for two or three days before they could be moved. Mm. That's and you read it well, John. It got to me. I'll tell you that the, the Civil War, oh. and I don't mean to to, well, to regurgitate this history over and over again, but it was a horrendous horrendous, terrible war, and to hear a young man from our area describing what it was like, mm. yeah, and to tell his mother, I'm still alive. Still alive, yeah. Wow. Well, and probably the last time he's going to... And nowadays, I, to, not to interrupt you, but nowadays, our boys are over there texting their parents right. and on the computer sending emails from wherever they are. Amazing. You bring up a point that... It kind of gets under my skin. A reporter will go over there for three days or something like that and come back with all this voluminous information that he has seen or she has seen personally and writes it up. And I say, how much can they see in three days or gather in three days, either not listening to people or just almost speculating? This is what they're going to see because they hate the war. Okay, everybody hates war. So they come back and write these things. That, uh, well, it's amazing because they were not only coming back and writing, but they're reporting. Yes, from yeah. from three, like it's authentic, three, like yeah, it's from three miles away. <laughs> well, we saw this puff of smoke. Here's that, a guy who was right underneath the puff of smoke. And you stopped that just right because that's the last letter he wrote. Oh no! Come on, it's the last letter he wrote. No. Oh my goodness! Well, yeah. how did he meet his demise? Can okay, here we go. Else? Okay. This is written by um, Captain John McGuire, uh, Company 1, 153rd New York Volunteers, Cedar Run. That's where the battle was. It's actually Cedar Creek. Cedar Creek. We've stopped there. Steve and I and son Mark stopped there. And it's outlined, and it's interesting because the trenches, the breastworks are still there. You can see mounds where they had their own breastworks. Yeah, breastworks, uh, I mean, Go ahead. we might have misunderstood earlier, because breastworks weren't always trenches. No. Breastworks were sometimes above the ground. That's right. Yeah. But well, I, yeah, I was yeah. wrong in saying that they were similar. They were shallow trenches, but they were above yeah. ground. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, you got that right. Thank you got you. that right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, that's interesting. And it's right off Interstate uh, I-81, north west virginia cedar creek and it's hard to see but if you go off there you can see as i said the breastwork there's some uh there are some plaques there describing what went on but that's where this battle was cedar creek battle of cedar creek this is from as i said captain john mcguire and dear mrs lucas your letter of the 28th now this is november 7th so this letter here was September 26. So from September 26, when she writes a letter on the 28th, he's already dead, but she doesn't know it. And you'll see it it's later on. Your letter of the 28th of last month to your son James was received by me yesterday. As Jimmy is not now with the regiment, nor do I know where to direct it, I thought I would tell you all about him. He was hit with a musket ball in the back of his head and fell forward on his face on the morning of the 19th of October. I thought he was killed. The rebels were close on and we were, we were retreating at the time and did not dare stop 
nor let any of my men stop to pick him up for fear of being taken prisoners. In the evening we drove the money, the, the enemy, and occupied our old camp long enough to get our meals, for the rebels surprised us again, and we were hardly time to get out of our tents before the rebels were coming to our camp, shooting us down. We followed the rebels to Strasbourg, three miles from here, that same night, and did not come back to this camp until the 21st. And then the doctor of the regiment said he had seen Jimmy, and that he was in the hospital, that he was wounded in the back of his head and in the elbow. The doctor said he did not dare amputate his arm for fear it would kill him. He said he did not think Jimmy would live. But doctors are not always correct in their opinions. How about today? <laughs> Some die that they think will live. Others live that they think will die. I do not know where Jimmy is now. I have not heard from him since he was wounded here and was sent to Martinsburg. As soon as I hear from him or about him, I will let you know. James was a good soldier, and I always thought he was a good Christian. He attended church regularly at every opportunity. I am, Madam, sincerely yours, Lieutenant or Captain John F. McGuire. Oh, boy. The next one is from Cedar Creek, Virginia. A camp of the 153rd Regiment, New York State Volunteers, November 7, 1864. So this one... So she wrote on the 28th of September, this is also on the 7th, this one is written on the 7th and it's from the assistant surgeon. Your letter of the 27th was received today and as our chap chaplain is absent, I take the liberty of answering you regarding your son James. I did not see him after he was wounded but have conversed with a number of persons who saw him at the hospital in Newton, Virginia. He was wounded in his right arm in the early part of the engagement and while going to the rear, as our forces were retreating before the enemy, he was hit again by a bullet in the back part of his head, which passed downward into the base of his brain, cutting off the optic nerve and producing certain loss of vision. Dr. Snow told me that he saw him a few minutes before he, that Dr. Snow, left Newton on the day after the battle. He was still alive, but little prospect of recovery. I'm well acquainted with your son and can bear evidence to the fact that a braver man did not exist in the 153rd Regiment. He was respected by every officer in regiment, and had he not been severely wounded in the late battle, would undoubtedly have received a commission. I can assure you, madam, I sympathize deeply with you in the loss of your son and in Prince if he is dead. I suppose he doesn't know for sure, but anyway, he puts that in parentheses. If he is dead, and I have no need means of knowing at present, will make every effort to gain intelligence of him. I was wounded myself and taken prison early on the fatal morning of the 19th of October, succeeded in making my escape at night and rejoining my poor, shattered regiment. I found them in the same position they occupied in the morning. They're, they were the last to leave the breastworks in the morning and the first to plant their colors on our works in the evening. Any further information I can give you regarding James will be given as candidly and as foregoing. Wow. And the next one is, uh, now we go from November, yeah, November 7th to, Feb to February 2nd of the next year. So she's really, I don't think there's any evidence to know that she was aware of his death. So we're three and months later. I think. Wow. But anyway, this is uh, written by the chaplain. And dear Margaret, or dear Madam, Mrs. Margaret Lucas, uh, I received from Captain McGuire a letter addressed to him dated January 9th on which you make inquiry concerning your son, his state of mind at the time of his death. So she does know he's dead, but I don't know when she found out or how she found out. Yeah. There's no information about that. You also state that you wrote to the chaplain of this regiment and received an answer from Dr. Sweeney. That's the assistant uh, surgeon. As I was absent or on sick leave, when your letter reached the regiment and was unable to return for several weeks, I presume the doctor forgot to mention to me on my arrival that I had been received and answered. This fact did not come to my knowledge until I learned it through Captain McGuire's letter. I am well acquainted with your son and with him during the Battle of Cedar Creek, and immediately after the engagement was for several days at Newton with our wounded. I helped carry your son to the hospital, and it was my privilege to do all in my power to render our wounded comfortable and minister to their wants. 
Your noble boy was apparently resigned and bore up under his suffering with a heroism which proved that he was as brave in the hospital as upon the battle field. Mm. During the three days and nights that I was with them, I found the surgeons every way in their power providing for the wants and toiling earnestly and faithfully in addressing the wounds of those under their charge. Your son received every attention could be given him, and I was greatly grieved when the tidings of his death reached me. Wearied and sick myself and compelled soon after the battle to return to my home to recruit my health, for this reason, I regret I can give you no definite information concerning his death and state of mind at that time. Of this you can rest assured, that he was faithful in the discharge of his duties as a soldier and beloved by his companions and associates throughout the regiment. We deeply mourn his loss, trusting that he who orders all things well, who heareth his children when they cry, will pour out upon you his richest blessing and bind up your wounds and cheer and comfort you in your deep bereavement. That's the last it, letter. But isn't that amazing? Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Somewhere, John, there are records that might tell the exact day he died, because you don't Well, I got that. it. I oh, got you it. do? Yep. Oh, yeah. that's And Kimberly. Sure. No. Kimberly LeMay. I'm oh, going back okay. to her. Okay. And she has written for the Lake Champlain Weekly three segments of this oh, battle. Yes. Oh, yeah. And that was back. I brought them with me. Uh, he died on the 19th of November uh, in a Baltimore did. hospital. Okay. Uh, so there you go. And that's, that's wonderful. I want to pause for just a moment sure. and collect our thoughts before we wrap it up. Because this is a lot for me to assimilate in one city. Because it's, uh, it's not unheard of, but it's almost unique to have that many letters. 60 for, letters. Isn't from, that amazing? from one person surviving today. I mean, we all see the antiques road show and some of these other things where we have an occasional tin type and some memorabilia uh, and uh, a couple of letters. But I don't think I've ever seen that many all in one collection. So the fact that he had that in that box of his in the ba in the bank, thank God he was a pack rat like you and I oh. are and that we have that to talk about today because isn't that an amazing way to uh, close the gap between 1864, 1865, and 2011. Amazing. There's, there's pathos. Yeah. There's a little humor early in those letters. Yeah. There are, wouldn't you love to have met that kid? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, you really, and we talked about interviewing Broder Lucas because he, I envision him as being a little bit like his, uh, his, his uncle, although probably not. Yeah, I would say he was as certainly as, uh, uh, as you know, as brave and willing to take a risk. Uh, but uh, I don't know whether he would have been. Uh, Broder would not have been a, um, would not have gone to war, because back then, you know. A lot of these fellows from the farm went to war for the excitement of it. Oh, of course they did. And not thinking. They weren't there because they hated slavery. I shouldn't say that, but that was the truth. Oh, absolutely true. And they weren't there to save the Union. They were there for the excitement and whatever was going to happen, where they were going. and, uh, and But then to see all this, what kind of an impact that must have had on them. It is a treasure. It's uh, a, an historic treasure for you to have all these things. We're going to talk a little bit more about it in just a moment. Okay. Recently there was a survey conducted uh, of the man on the street and the vast majority of men, women, and children on the street in America's cities have no knowledge of how our government is put together, what the, what the uh, Constitutional Convention was all about? What is the Bill of Rights? Who is the Vice President of the United States? Okay. The America? Is still Spiro? Yeah, yeah right now. <laughs> America failed. The vast majority of people don't know and don't care about anything about politics and about our government and so on, and it proves it proves a point that I want to make about the Civil War. Um, a lot of school kids today have no idea what 
the Vietnam War was all about. I certainly don't know what the Korean conflict was all about. And so how can they expect it to know very much except what they might have seen on television about the Civil War? I think people who watch this program carefully today are getting the picture. It was a horrendous war. It was a horrible war. As a doctor, you can appreciate what, how terrible it was and how many people died with brothers fighting brothers, as they say, the North against the South in our Civil War for all the reasons you know. And so Calvin made an excellent point when you were reading those letters from commanding officers back to a mother here in the North Country saying, you know, what an outstanding soldier your son was. How, how I, I, you know, I followed him up to this point in time, then I lost track of him, then somebody picks up the, and carries and so on. So with all the people that were killed in that war, to have a commanding officer write those letters, to have those letters, and to have them survive and still be extant in the year 2011, that's, that's a pretty nice thing, John, don't yeah, you think? Yeah, it's amazing that they could do that. You mentioned that face-to-face -face combat, and how many were killed in, in, in one day? Oh, yes, just oh, in, in, in all those battles. Just, I mean, just how to it. identify them, and some of them, like it says here, unfortunately, heads off? Sure. Did they have yeah. dog tags back then? No, I don't think they did. Yeah, so there was I'm not certainly not aware would of them. You know, how would you know how to identify them? You didn't have a dentist around telling them what the yeah. teeth look like. Maybe they didn't have teeth. Yeah. So how did they identify all yeah, those teeth? It was people? horrendous. Oh. And yet there are rec records that are meticulous enough that might surprise you. And the archives mostly are available online, which is even more interesting. Yeah. So I'd be, I hope somebody including the young lady who wrote these articles for Lake Tram Plain Weekly, will start to connect the dots. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about this. Yeah. Tell me about it. Okay, we have started talking about it, and I didn't get permission from Lake Champlain Weekly to put their She'll magazine on, uh, or their it. newspaper. I guess she will. Caroline will get it. She'll love it. Anyway, that uh, Kimberly as you've said, LeMay wrote articles about the 153rd uh, Regiment of New York Volunteers, of which, uh, well, James Lucas was a member of that. And she focuses on him, but also on the battles that they went to and the struggles that they had to deal with. And an, an amazing amount of information that she got from these letters and also more in line with what happened to him at the end because it doesn't say and obviously doesn't say in these letters when he died I, she found that out and didn't know where he was in his final days in a hospital or where he was buried so she found that all out that he was in a Baltimore hospital and uh, was buried in Baltimore and took the picture of his gravesite in Baltimore isn't that neat isn't that and s such a lot of uh, uh, I say work, I'm sure some of it was work, but and, and enjoyment that she got out of this, I hope. And it was so helpful to us to see that in writing, to take these letters and to literally, um, it's, it's like taking a language, written some other language, and writing it and typing it in readable words. She wasn't able to do all of it, but most of it. Amazing person. Thank goodness for people like that. What's yes. this other one? Is this a follow-up? They're all three so, different. She wrote it three different well, weeks. Three. Oh, three I Three different see. weeks. Okay. Yeah. Give, give, this this, but, this is available right? online, so give the dates. Okay, here's online. the date. The first date is... The first uh, one is April, March 26th, April 1st, 2008. Volume 8, issue 35. And then... That's right. It is online. You can go through this paper page by page. And then April 2nd. 2008, Volume 8, Issue 36. And the last one is April 9th, 2008, Volume 8, Issue 37. Congratulations to the, uh, to the people who published this paper yes. and to Caroline. As a Canadian citizen, to be interested enough in America, is she? She's an American citizen who lives in Canada. Who lives in Canada, because her, hus her husband's Canadian. All right, I got that right. To be interested enough 
to work. I mean, she's a hardworking gal, and she drives down here every day to go to work and goes to all the, all the yeah, all the meetings and and uh, cares about history. And it's nice to have a publication like this that there are historical stories in this paper every single week. And I, I insist that my wife shops long enough in this certain grocery store so that I can read the paper from one, from the front to the back every single week. And then I take it with me so she can do the crossword puzzle at home, you know. But isn't it nice to have people like that who care? Yes. And like this young woman who cares enough to do this and, and to, have a, to have an editor in a paper that says, go for it. Because that's, this ties all, like I said, connecting the dots. You know what I mean? It's uh, it, it is, and it's 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 good that somebody has a job like this. But it's an endeavor. It's a joyful endeavor. I can tell just by the way she writes yeah. that she cares about this and has put it on paper. Now, are there any pieces of this story that we haven't? That we any blanks in this story that you hope to fill in the future, or somebody who might be watching this program who knows something that you'd like to add to this story, John? Well, if there are any other relatives in this area, and we certainly know what he said about a hundred uh, of uh, Champlainers that were in or about his regiment, so there must be a La Fountains, Gokies, uh, and uh, who is the other one that might be able to be? I'm not so sure. Myat, the Christian Myats, but the I'm not sure that that's the same. And Hubbles, uh, what was the other one that was a relatively well-known name in the area? No, I guess that's about it. But there are others. Oh I yes, mean, there has to be. You know, we're we're uh, in a sense we're gadflies on this program. We get people fired up about something, and they go and look at the drawers and see what old letters and pictures they might have. And we always invite people to respond, either to you or to Calvin or to myself, and say, look, "Guess what I got over here? I got 78 letters from the." Wouldn't that be great if we could find? tie another young person right. together with these letters. I, I have never seen that many in one place. Who was it that I was telling this about that says they have a relative that has uh, had letters from, I think it was Bob Buran. Bob Buran's wife or somebody in their family has letter, a letter or some letters from Civil War. I'll have to ask That would again. be wonderful. As always, John, it's so great to see you. Let me tell you one story about Clarenceville. Well, we got need time? another story. Uh, well, uh, we got us. We got you it. brought up Clarenceville. Clarenceville was the site of a movie about the Dion quintuplets. Quintuplets. This was back in 1992, I think. And you got a call from a fellow who was putting the movie on. He said, we need some old cars over here. Would you bring some old cars over? So I said, how many do you need? Well, bring over as many as you can. So we took six, we took six old cars over there. And one of them is actually on the front part of the second segment of that movie. And, oh, really? Yeah. It was, uh, who was the main? I can't even remember the Mo, Bo, uh, uh I don't know. Anyway, it was a well put together movie. And uh, you so was you running. Got, you got a car. Got a car. It. I got six cars in it, but oh. only one showed up very well. I'll tell you who was in charge of it, because we try to sneak in to be shown <laughs> the movies, and they just keep us out. There were a bunch of young women that ran that. that were directors. They weren't the chief director in name, but they ran the show, and it went over very Isn't well. Isn't that great? No. Yeah. What year were those cars? Or the quints? Quince. Who cares about the cars, John? I want to know what I the care about the cars. I, I can tell you about the cars, but I can't remember. I don't know what They're about they my going. age. They were a little bit younger, 31, 32, somewhere in there. They might have been, uh, I, I don't know. Now we have so many uh, sex doublets and, yeah. and, and septuplets. <laughs> Quint, octuplets. <laughs> oh, I don't even want to go that far. But anyway, yeah. in those days, I, when I was a little kid, uh, that, that, that those quintuplets were uh, just a fascinating story. Bo it? Bridges, Bo Bridges, that Bo was Bridges. the name of the, he played the doctor. Oh, he did? He made lots of money on that and he See, really... Could, that's a role you could have done very well with. 
Huh? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> anyway, John, it's great to see you. Yep, always see great you. to see you. You always have some wonderful stories to tell. Tell your wife you didn't. You you'll never one up Gordy Little. Don't you no, ever, I know that. ever worry about no, that. I, don't know. I can't wait to see what it'll be like where we meet again to, and what subject we might be talking about. But again, thanks to our viewers for giving us suggestions about where to go. Some people tell us where to go. I know, and we don't want to go there. <laughs> and some people give us very good suggestions. Some people show us photographs and letters. We love to talk about one-room school houses. We did a recent show up here. Uh, whatever people want to watch, please tell us about it, and we'll try to rearrange our shows. We try to do at least one show a week. And for Calvin and me, it's going on 14 years, isn't it, Calvin? 97. 97, 19, that's right. 97, 97. isn't that amazing? Right. And Bob mm -hmm. Ben before that, and Calvin, the old soldier back here, starting yes. way back in the early 80s. So thank you very much for your comments. Uh, we sure would appreciate your support, your monetary support. In any, any way, shape, or form, get it to Calvin and care of Hometown Cable on the Ridge Road in Champlain. Thank you all for watching this program and for telling your friends about it. And don't forget, it's available at plattsburgh.com and at hometowncablenetwork.com. My daughter-in-law of mine up in Saranac Lake sent me a, an email this morning, urgent. You know it's urgent when it's all in caps when it comes an email, when it's all in caps. Gordy, you're back on the internet. We can watch all the old programs. And it's great, so people know about us around the world and at least around Clinton County in the North Country. And New Orleans and California, and that, I can tell you and that. And that too, and yep. Manassas, Virginia, and and in Well, Las not Vegas only but and, this, but a son in California, I mean, sorry, a son in New Orleans and a cousin in, in um, California. I got to tell him to look at the railroad, so he loves, this guy's lived for railroads, he's 82, he's lived to, he'd stop at every railroad track and wait 10 minutes if the train might be coming. This was 60 years ago, and he still loves railroads. How many people do we know like that, including our dear friend Jim Shaughnessy? I'm, I'm cleaning out my river room after a tree fell through the wall, and we got it all redone. That's why I'm going through all these papers. A nice note from Jim Shaughnessy and a postcard. Thank you all for coming over. We kept the man in his room for six hours, wouldn't even let him go to the bathroom because we were afraid he'd leave us. We made him talk about railroads and every one of his railroad books, and that's at least ten years ago. Can you believe that? So I found that card, and I saw that he had signed it, his signature on that, and I said, oh, I got an autograph of Jim Shaughnessy. So we know lots of people who love railroads, as we all do, because you and I were brought up in the steam age, right? Mm -hmm. All right. We could go on. This could be another whole tele uh, television show. In the meantime, who knows where we're going to be next time, folks, for our little corner.